Elimination, Part 3. This is Martha Olson, Introduction to Nursing Concepts. Our assessment patterns then are going to be uh, three of them urine and the other ones are bowel. They are uh, talked about on page 1046. A lot of these will be things that you are, are, are aware of already. Incontinency, there are several types of urinary incontinence. Our purposes for this class are not to memorize or know the type of incontinence, but also to know, more importantly, to know what is the result for that person of that incontinence. It's a common problem that affects people of all ages. Young women, Potter and Perry states it's from local irritating factors. About 15 to 30 percent of adult women tend to uh, experience incontinence. There are some surgeries that can be done where they do a bladder sling, pulling that bladder back up. Typically after a woman has given birth and the heavy weight of that uh, uterus um, causes the bladder to kind of weaken or to um, fall. We know that it's a myth that incontinency is caused by aging. It seems like if you work with the elderly or in long-term care, that what you remember is the patients that are incontinent, but remember many of them um, still are continent. Older adults are more susceptible because of maybe functional limitations, meaning they can't mo uh, be mobile to get up to the bathroom or they use a walker or need help to get to the bathroom, or maybe the environment in which they live in. Fecal incontinence or fecal soiling is also talked about in this unit. It's not as common, uh, but it's a very embarrassing uh, condition that some people have and are very reluctant to talk about. With urinary retention, uh, we know that it's a problem uh, with the inability of the bladder to be able to eliminate either partially or completely. On page 1046 in Potter and Perry, it talks about urinary retention with overflow, and that's where that pressure builds up and builds up until the uh, sphincter opens just a little bit and lets some of the urine out. And then when it relaxes just enough because there's not as much pressure on it, it tightens again, causing then that pressure to build up. Where that comes into problems uh, is for a patient that you may be um, thinking they're incontinent and you change their wet attends uh, several times throughout the day, but yet they're confused. A patient I had uh, several years ago, older man that was just so confused and I was assessing him, trying to figure out what was making him confused. The doctor came in and palpated his bladder and said, well, here's the problem. He is full of urine. And I said, well, he can't be because he ha we've changed him three or four times today in his wet attempts. So we did the bladder scan, found out that he had over a thousand cc's of urine in that bladder, and that's what was causing, you know, his restlessness. So my word to you is with urinary retention, don't be afraid to do a bladder scan. You don't have to have a physician's order. It's non-invasive. There's no charge for that before you call or if you have questions about maybe a patient that is being kind of restless or not um, acting like themselves, even if they are having overflow urine and you think that they're just incontinent. Some of our other uh, problems that can lead to be led to from urinary retention are bacteremia uh, or bacteria in the urine or a urosepsis where there's bacteria in the bloodstream from that urinary source. As we look again at that retention, uh, remember to be assessing and uh, palpating that bladder, doing the bladder scan so that we can identify that before it becomes a problem. In critical thinking, now that we've talked about urinary incontinency and urinary retention, the question I would throw out to you to think about or talk with your friends about is, which one is more serious, urinary incontinence or urinary retention? And have a reason why. Our urinary tract infection is fairly common. Uh, we see that in the hospital. We see this in the clinic. It's more common in women because of that short urethra that they have that allows the bacteria to come from the outside and uh, get up into that bladder. Causes are uh, decrease in hand washing, perhaps wiping back to front, and we see that most common in two-year-olds and then in some of our patients that uh, require uh, perineal care from the nursing staff. 
two-year-olds because they want to wipe themselves for the first time and they wipe from the back to the front and then we also have the um, peri care in the long-term care or home health that's not performed correctly and the E. coli from the uh, rectal area then are being brought forward into the short urethra. Sexual intercourse is the other time we see urinary tract infections increase um, and that is where good education for uh, these young women is very important because they need to know that they need to avoid before sex and after to flush the germs and bacteria from that area um, out of their body. So as a nurse, a lot of these we can prevent through education, through correct technique with perineal care and hand washing and such things like that. We know that uh, urinary tract infections, uh, if they are acquired in the hospital, they are not being paid for by Medicare or Medicaid since 2008. And that's because they said they could have been prevented. And so looking at dollars and cents wise, we really need to do a good job of preventing urinary tract infections. We oftentimes get a UA on admission just to prove or show that they came in with that urinary tract infection, that we didn't cause that. It's the most common healthcare acquired infection. 80% according to Potter and Perry are from indwelling catheters with 1 million UTIs in the US each year. In the book it talks about the catheter associated UTI. We will be learning how to put in indwelling catheters and we know that doing that with correct technique is going to be vital so that we are not uh, causing these catheter associated UTIs that can uh, cost anywhere from $600 to $2,800 to treat. They cause longer hospitalization. There is morbidity and mortality associated with the UTI and also the cost due to longer hospital stays. So we've got to get very vigilant at preventing them. The signs and symptoms of UTI, the dysuria and urgency, uh, are sometimes the first things that a woman will notice. But one comment that I would like to make as you look at this list is that many of your elderly do not exhibit these typical signs and symptoms. In the elderly, they may just have the mental confusion. And a good nurse in long-term care uh, will call and ask the doctor, can we send a UA down to check for a UTI? Mabel's more confused than she's been, and we just wondered if she's having a UTI. They don't run fevers. They will not complain of urgency or frequency. And so uh, we need to kind of be aware of changes maybe for the elderly in identifying a UTI. On page 1046, these are listed. Any untreated UTI, we know E. coli from the colon uh, is most common. The bacteria in the urine can ascend up to the kidney causing a glomerulitis. And then if it gets into the bloodstream, it would be called then a urosepsis, all very serious conditions. Our eighth edition uh, has the new Bristol stool scale. Uh, it lists the type of stool or BM that a person has on a scale of one to seven. Diarrhea then is one of our elimination things that we need to talk about because um, it is very common and it can be very serious, especially for the very young, this very small child, and the elderly. When we look at the loss of a fluid and electrolytes, that's really our main concern with dehydration because when that um, is flowing out of the body, it's pulling potassium and a lot of our electrolytes with that that can then cause that overwhelming uh, fluid and electrolyte change in the body that can then cause all kinds of problems like um, telemetry or cardiac changes, um, muscle weakness or muscle cramping due to all that. When we look at diarrhea, we know the causes can be many. Antibiotic use because it disrupts that normal E. coli or that normal flora in the bowel. Enteral nutrition, and we'll be talking about that. Um, that's our, your tube feedings that we give people, and it runs in too quick. It's too rich, and their body can't handle it. And then from nutrition, you should remember that diarrhea is a sign of food poisoning uh, that we can see. We need to record the number and frequency of the stools, especially for the very young and old. Like I said, I had a child that uh, at nine months of age had gastroenteritis. She had like nine diarrhea stools in a very short period of time, and they wanted to hospitalize her with IVs and um, precautions, but I took her home, did the Gatorade, um, totally took her off of milk products, 
uh, to be able to help get her over that gastroenteritis. So for uh, her, it was a lot of weight loss and um, kind of a lethargic kid for a while. C. diff or Clostridium difficile is one of the bacteria that causes problems. It's usually from overgrowth or contact with C. difficile. And when you take microbiology, take special attention to C. diff because it's very hard to get rid of. Uh, your patient with a C. difficile um, bacterial infection then will have a very pugnant odor to that uh, stool that they expel. It's usually from antibiotics, chemotherapy, or some of our scopes and surgeries to the bowel. And we know from page 1092 that healthcare workers' hands or direct contact with the environment can cause this. The other real important thing that goes with our infection control unit is looking at that use of soap and water to remove the spores from the hands. The gels do not take care of C. diff, and so anybody with that, we would need to take special precautions for them. Constipation, we'll be doing some activities in the classroom. When we look at constipation, there are a lot of things as a nurse we can do to prevent it. Our patient with Parkinson's disease would have decreased mobility and would be at risk for um, having constipation. Laxatives cause the opposite problem. They um, promote bowel elimination. Peristalsis increases when we exercise, but as you age, uh, sometimes peristalsis does not increase. And then hypothyroidism can cause constipation because it slows the body, not hyperthyroidism. So the correct answer is your diagnosis of Parkinson's. Other things we know that can cause constipation are your pain pills or your opioids. Straining uh, with a hard stool can cause a Valsalva maneuver, and I think that's how Elvis died. And that can be related to some of our cardiovascular changes. Any abdominal surgery, because uh, any straining can cause pressure on those sutures or that surgical site that they have. Your patient with glaucoma needs to prevent constipation at all costs because when they bear down and strain, it puts intraocular pressure up higher and can cause more eye damage. And then your patient with a head injury, if you're working in an intensive care unit, with a patient from a motor vehicle accident or a fall with a head injury, any straining from trying to remove a constipated stool would cause increased intracranial pressure that we don't want. Your patient that has an impaction is very serious, and we need to, uh, as a nurse, hopefully prevent that. But it's unrelieved constipation. We do a fairly good job in long-term care of keeping track of who hasn't had a BM in a couple of days and then starting the standard protocol for that. Where we tend to not always do the best job is in the hospital because uh, we aren't constantly thinking about about that or keeping track of it like we should. I learned from a, a nurse that used to work in long-term care that many of your patients, older patients that are restless, not sleeping, not eating, they're constipated. And if we can get those bowels moving, they um, do much, much better for us. So it's from unrelieved constipation on page 1091. Our complications is where we really need to put a star on our page by this because if you don't relieve that impaction, that bowel gets bigger and bigger and bigger and they can actually blow through the bowel causing a peritonitis or a condition called toxic megacolon. I'm not sure what I need to say about flatulence. I think we all know what it is and what causes it. There are certain foods that are more gas producing. On page 1092, a patient after abdominal surgery, that's one of our signs that that bowel is waking up. And so we ask our patients when we're down doing the abdominal uh, inspection, palpation, and auscultating bowel sounds, are you passing gas? And oftentimes I will say to the patient, you know, when you're passing gas, that means we get to start feeding you. And then they'll say, yes, I've been in here passing gas. Sometimes you can hear them in the bathroom eliminating that extra gas. Hemorrhoids are an enlarged vein, um, and we see uh, patients in the hospital with hemorrhoids, uh, maybe from delivering a baby, uh, heart failure, many of those things can cause that. Our nursing diagnosis, I would challenge you to put numbers beside these and then come and ask, what do you think is my number one nursing diagnosis or problem that I'm concerned about and which one of these is my least concerning? As we look at planning and promotion, going back to nutrition, we know we can eliminate um, a lot of problems by having a good diet, 
drinking enough water and getting exercise in our diet. And with our older adults, again, we need to think about that prostate gland being enlarged and some of the changes they have as a result of the aging process. This ends PowerPoint number three. Thanks.